could you please state your full name? Hi, I'm James Edward Griffith. I go by Jim Griffith. Um, I'm from Carlisle. And um, I'm lucky to have a lot of family in the local area, which for many people, if you're into genealogy or your past, it makes it so easy when you're, you're living um, right where everything happened. And um, I've always had family members who are interested in history, so I heard stories growing up from both sides. And it, it became pretty personal for me in the last few years. Uh, my father developed dementia, and he's now in a local nursing home. And um, that really struck home for me, like, like how many people in my family I should be talking to or learning from or sharing stories with um, partly because I couldn't talk to my dad as much but also just to be able to share with my own family or kids and and that sort of revived the interest I used to have in local history and um, things that I you take for granted growing when you're younger like like we're, we're near Williams Grove where they, they have um, the Grange events and they bring the, the, the steam tractors or here in Carlisle, all the local history with, with all of the, the Revolutionary Civil War history, the trains that used to go through town. And so, um, especially the last few years when uh, my wife decided to open a store in the Carlisle area and we found ourselves touring real estate to rent or maybe to buy or whatever might work. And so many of these buildings in the downtown are old or have their own history. And I found myself sometimes more interested in the history side than the real estate shopping side. And I tend to go to the Historic Society just to see what was there before to get the pictures or the information. And have to remind myself we're actually thinking about a store in this location. It's not just what was there. Um, but it, there is just an amazing amount of history in the local area. I think that's really what just, it just, the more you find, the more you want to find. So. So what drew you to 11 East High Street, which ended up being your store? Well, yeah, what drew us here, it's, it's funny actually, I, I remember the building and the adjacent building from when I was a kid. I, I had a friend who was really into tropical fish and there was a store right next door in the 80s called Fish and Stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was a nice little business. And so I knew the street area from that. Um, but then after we opened our store, which was at the time at the Point Mall in Carlisle, um, I was driving by one one winter night and I looked over and I saw this wonderful storefront and at the time it was all boarded up and it had for sale signs and you couldn't see very much. And um, it made us want to look at this building. And the only issue with the building was the stores were in a very dilapidated state. Um, it had gone through various tenants, it had apartments and stores and it had gone through various tenants over the years and it was almost like every tenant would leave and it would be in worse condition than the previous. Um, so the owners at the time were not interested in renting, they were only interested in selling the building. So it, it made it a little hard for us at first because we weren't sure if that was the way we could go or would go. Um, so we, we started looking at many other properties and we, we still like this one, we love the architecture. And um, it was actually the um, Cumberland County um, Revitalization Organization, I think it's CADIC, mm -hmm. um, who we were talking to and they encouraged us to look again um, partly because they had been talking to the sellers and they knew that they really did want to get motion and get something to happen. And so we went through a very long process um, of not only looking at this site but others and uh, checking the building top to bottom, having, having some professional surveys done and eventually did find an approach that would let us take part ownership in the building and move our store here and also a second store. And um, that's, that's been that's been a, a neat process in its own right. I mean, we, we did work with some contractors, given it's commercial, for electrical and plumbing and a lot of key areas. But when it came to remodeling or the interiors, we did a lot of that work ourselves. And um, in a sense, we, we, we took some risks, like the whole ceiling in the main story area where we're sitting, um, the ceiling height was a conventional drop ceiling height. And it, it was covered in metal HVAC and wood, and they, they had plywood where there were gaps. And you could barely see this 19th century ceiling in one or two places. And most of the advice we were getting was to keep all that HVAC because of the cost to replace it. And we talked to a contractor said, actually, you really don't need all that. You could remove it. So we went ahead and did. And we didn't even know at the time if by removing all that wood and all that metal, if there would be anything savable. And we were very fortunate and that when they did all that installation work, which went back to the 20s, they didn't damage the upper ceiling to the extent that we couldn't bring it back. So we were able to do that. We did a lot of repair work. We, we purchased lights from Bedford Antiques, which is down the street. 
and had those rewired, did a lot of that work ourselves, um, and, and worked with, a, with an electrical company, Tucky, to have them rehunt. So we're just really thrilled to, to have like the, what's basically the 19th century tailor shop's footprint redone as an art activity center with pottery and, and crafts. And it just, it just feels like it's, it's what the building wanted almost. It, it just feels like we brought it back to a usable state. So. And why was it important to you and your wife to bring it back to that state? Well, that's a good question because when we came in, we could have gone the other way. There was still drywall, there was still the frame of a drop ceiling. We could have just made this a conventional office again. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, there's a little bit of the sense that you want to create something that people would like to come to as a, like a destination. Um, but I, I have to say, a lot of it was the appreciation for the history and being just amazed by what was here. Um, the original foyer in the building, like the vestibule you enter through, um, still has the original ceiling, the original paint on the molding. It just so happened to survive. It's almost like by accident. And the doors on the building appear in 1860s photographs. And it just felt like how often do you get the opportunity to save something or bring it back instead of just covering it up again for another 50 years. So we just took that chance and went with it and we're, we're really glad we did. And what has the response been to the work you've done? Uh, very positive. I think a lot of people come in and they don't realize the condition it was in. And that's fine. Um, but those who ask, we do explain what we've done. Or that while remodeling, we found things like a, a brick engraved 1800, which was neat. And we don't know if it was reused or there originally. But it's just neat that there's been something here since the 1750s. So we get a lot of people stopping by who... Um, maybe they do an art project or they just come in to visit and they, they talk about um, things that we didn't notice. We had a carpenter stop in one of our first days and he noticed the next door property has big wood doors that open up for the old rigid veranda system that would come out and looked at our building and, and explained the type of techniques they used to make our spiral staircase back then from his background. And then more recently we had two people come in with local with personal ties to the building. Uh, one lady came through and her father had a shoe repair store here in the early 1950s and then she sent us a letter with photographs and stories about growing up here and how they used the building and we're still in touch with her and we'd like to um, share more with her too. And we also had a person stop by who when he was a kid here he won a yo-yo contest out front of the building. This was a hobby store in the late 1950s. Uh, we had a, a lady stop by whose family members were involved with the Flower Law Firm in the 80s and 90s here. So that's been fun, just having people come in and reminisce and they, they, they do their best to explain what it was like when they were here. So it's, um, we're, we're just, we feel like we're just briefly borrowing this building, even if it's 20 or 30 years, because that's just a sliver of its history. And it, it's nice to have like a little piece of that history. So if you were, if somebody were thinking of buying a historic building um, and they either wanted to live in it or open a business, um, do you have any advice for that? What's something I, you've learned? I do. I, I think that the hardest part is, um, especially if you have that interest in history or you have that interest in nostalgia, um, you, you have to stay a little mentally, emotionally separated from it until you get to the point where it looks like it is a good decision. And like, for example, some of these buildings, um, they might have a structural issue, they, they might have, like say you're a retailer or you want to put a store in, there might have been something done to the building that wasn't approved by code. So what we'd really recommend is um, talk early, like the borough zoning office in Carlisle, they're very open, they're very collaborative, and they'll tell you, like they'll go to a property and look at it with you and tell you what's possible or if it's home or business. Um, and another source, if you're into the business side, is um, local organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, um, Downtown Carlisle Association, uh, Cumberland County Revitalization, and they also work on the residential side, not just the commercial. These groups, they, they know the buildings. They, they know, they, they've been in them themselves, or they know people who have. And um, you might find an issue like a leak in the roof or even a structural issue, there are some of these things that are very solvable, it might be worth working through. But to back to my original point, just be sure that your emotional attachment isn't taking priority over what's realistic for you as a person or as within the realm of your comfortable. Because old buildings, they, they can get into some major issues. Just you need to do your homework up front, but it's worth it in the end. So. Um, so switching gears, you helped with the Greater Carlisle Heart and Soul Project. Yes. Um, 
What made you want to get involved with that project? Well, uh, originally uh, I learned of that project through um, the, the Greater Carlisle Association had a series of, of meetings where they invited the community. And I believe it was mentioned there as a new initiative they were starting. And um, it was right when I was getting interested in, or getting interested again in history. And it, I just liked the fact that it was a new project. You, you folks needed volunteers. And um, it was just a, a way to try like, like, like a volunteer activity related to history. And, and, and it was just worked well at the time for me. Um, I think if I joined something else that had already been in existence, I wouldn't have known really, I wouldn't have felt like I knew how to get my feet wet or like how to start. Sometimes it's fun to join something that's new. So. Um, and how did you feel once you started, you collected a lot of stories for the project. Um, did you learn anything from other community members? I, I did. Um, one thing I learned, and even in like some of the, the training sessions we had to go out and talk to the community, um, is I, I learned just, um, how much in common I had with other people who were also interested in history, and, or just with people in general. I mean, everyone has a story, or has a family, and some people who were participating weren't from the local area, but they actually were participating, they said, because they weren't from the local area and they wanted to develop a better connection. Um, or they wanted, they, they remembered when they lived in an area, like how much they appreciated the history there. Um, one thing that surprised me, but I, I really got to enjoy hearing so much is, how much a t um, value people place in the rural areas and the natural resources in the local area. I mean, I, I really do tend to gravitate to like the downtowns and the, the people stories of like how the community developed and like buildings like this. But there is a, a vast history of the natural resources and the local parks and the streams and the fishing, the fly fishing. And um, I, many people said they like to live here because they have such access to such things or they can go hike a trail and be home in 20 minutes or um, one lady said something that I liked that it reminded her when she was in the service living in Germany, the, the local area. Uh, I think m m many of the comments were about the, the rural side, which was neat. Um, so it sounds like it made you sort of have a, a new view, a new outlook on the region. Yes, it right? did. It did. And it tied that all together. Mm -hmm. um, like even me, I remember growing up living either in Carlisle or the Dillsburg area at different times. And knowing many of the local farmers because my parents had horses and um, they were elderly at the time or one farmer, I'd love to find out where his farm was. He lived in Sidensburg and he was a Russian immigrant and didn't speak much English, but he'd, he'd emigrated to the U.S. in like the 20s. And it's, it kind of gets into, again, why I'm interested in history now, because it's not possible to go learn his story anymore. But it's neat to do like, like this volunteering with Heart and Soul to capture stories that we can capture and uh, to flesh out the, the region's story is neat, so. So you did a lot of interviewing for the project, but mm -hmm. I don't think you've ever been asked yourself, what do you value and what would you hate to lose in the greater Carlisle community? So I'm gonna ask you that. What do you value and what would you hate to lose? Well, I, I think, you know, I might have answered that question differently a year or two ago. I really think what I value is the sense of community in the local area. Um, I, I, I know especially like with changes in the job market, um, we, we don't have the manufacturing we used to have. We're fortunate to have Dickinson College, the Army War College, but many people really, this is like a, like a bedroom community and then they commute to places like Harrisburg or Camp Hill. And I would be very concerned, and that's another reason why we're glad to be downtown with our store, if trends would get to the point where people really don't want to gather in Carlisle or do activities in Carlisle, they'd rather, you know, they just sleep here and go somewhere else. That's a real shame if we lose that sense of community or tradition here. Or, People don't want to um, come together for like like events that, that we have in town, like summer fair and things like that. So. Do you have any ideas on how you think we could avoid that issue, where people don't want to come to the downtown any longer? Well, I, I think um, you know that's that's a that's a tough question, and I, I think the one thing that's really key. I mean, like for example, warehouses. I think that's been a very controversial topic for many years. Um, I, I think people just need to get to the point where we embrace that a little more. And the way I mean embrace is if a warehouse company comes to the, the borough and says, how can we be involved in the community? Just hold them to that. Get them involved in the community. Know up front what you need in the community. And that's more at a civic level. But, but I think at the community level, um, I think there, you know, the, the more people feel 
um, comfortable in their own town, I think the more effective they'll be. I mean, that might be going to a Dickinson event, even though you have no association with Dickinson, or going to Juneteenth at Hope Station and seeing what's happening in that corner of town, which is really great. I mean, there, there are a lot of things I think people have a, an image of town from 20 years ago, and, and they, they haven't really come. We've had people stop in here who say, I'm from Carlisle, but I haven't been downtown in years. Um, and one lady came to our store because she saw we were opening, and she came back to pick up her finished pottery a few days later, and she suddenly talked about how she saw Reds downtown, or she saw um, History on High, or, and, and so it's like they, they rediscover it kind of like we did a few years ago. But I, I do think that the basically just coming to town, taking part in events, visiting stores, taking walks, um, it's a very walkable town. I think there was an award for one of the most walkable towns. And, and just taking advantage of that, so. Well, is there anything you'd like to add that I've missed that you want to mention? Um, it, it, you know, it's kind of hard for me to pinpoint anything in particular. Um, I, I guess I, I would just say, um, you know, from, from my own example, it's never too early to take an interest in your own family or where you're from or the region you grew up in. Um, and, and it's sort of like, you know, even like our older generation, um, like the World War II generation, um, take time to talk to people, uh, get involved in the community, even get involved in a nursing home. I know my father, uh, with his dementia, there are a lot of lonely people at nursing homes and they have great stories. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it's always good to get away from the computer and the phone and get involved with people. I guess that's my, my preachy soapbox moment. But. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate sure. it. Absolutely.